Welcome. I am Dr. Kathy Bobay, a member of the MSU College of Nursing Alumni Board. It is my pleasure to moderate this broadcast of Conversations, a series of webinars sponsored by the college. The topic of today's webinar is the effects of stigma, mothers who are unable to breastfeed, and will be presented by Assistant Professor Dr. Joanne Goldborg. Let me begin with the provider disclosure statement. Our speaker attests that no financial relationship exists between herself and any commercial supporting entity, which would represent a conflict of interest or commercialize any presentation content. And there are no CEUs available for today's presentation. And now I'd like for you to meet the presenter. Dr. Joanne Goldbort has been with the MSU College of Nursing since 2014 and specializes in the area of breastfeeding research. She received her BSN from Indiana Wesleyan University, her MSN from Indiana State, and completed her PhD at Indiana University with a dissertation topic of The Perfect Storm, Unexpected Birthing Experiences and Perinatal Mood Disorders. Her topic of the effects of stigma for mothers who are unable to breastfeed is very relevant in the field of women's health as she describes the ever-changing social view of breastfeeding as a pendulum. I encourage everyone to type their questions into the Q&A box throughout the presentation. There will be time for questions and answers at the end when Dr. Goldbort finishes. Dr. Goldbort, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm pleased and very honored to be here this evening. Um, as you can see in this photo, my granddaughter is uh, all out dressed out in Spartan. Her uh, grandpa was, um, got his PhD here at Michigan State. So we were here for about 13 years, moved and went back down to Indiana and have returned because we said one of these days we will retire here in Indiana and that's where we are. She's two years old now, but she's as cute as a button and uh, we have a good time. So in this uh, uh, research project that I've done, I'm going to go over the background, uh, introduction, design of the study, research questions, sample characteristics, results, conclusions, and discussion. Um, I think I miss, oh no, here it is. So on this slide, I'd like to introduce my um, research team. I've been working with them since 2016, and we have published um, about eight articles since that time on breastfeeding issues. Uh, in part of our conversation of where to go with some of our breastfeeding research, um, the question came up because we were finding that the rates of exclusive breastfeeding um, they would start out at 80% or so in the hospital setting, and then they would taper down to about 25% uh, or more uh, once the woman got home or it didn't sustain itself into the six-month period. So Dr. Mary Bresnahan, um, she's from the MSU Department of Communication. She and Dr. Uh, Zhuang is our experts on stigma. Uh, Dr. Zhuang got her PhD here. She is at uh, Texas Christian. Uh, Elizabeth Bogdan Lovis is also at the MSU College of Human Medicine. And we have a grad student that also worked on this project. She will graduate, I believe, this December. Dr. Rose Hitt uh, is a uh, professor in the College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences at Albany College in New York. So we've been together for uh, actually only four years, but we've been very productive. And our inquiry was, What's going on with the uh, breastfeeding rates that they're not sustained? And, and so we kind of explored that with, let's see what's happening with our, our bottle feeding moms. So the other interest in this is um, the background with WHO, the World Health Organization and UNICEF, United Nations uh, International Children Education Fund. They came up with the um, Baby Friendly Initiative. And the reason for that, back in the early 70s, um, in our country, we had um, uh, formula companies that were sending and shipping off formula to companies in third, to countries in third world countries where women um, who were breastfeeding for many, many years without uh, the introduction of uh, artificial formula, um, they were introduced to this. And what happened was, uh, unfortunately, uh, they didn't have the clean water, they couldn't sustain, the, the, they, they wanted to be like the American, 
uh, you know, to emulate our high standards and, and our, our scientific uh, discoveries. And so they latched on to the um, formula, but what the problem they were having is if they didn't have clean water, their babies were getting diarrhea and dysentery and some other effects. Uh, that were very um, untoward and unexpected. Uh, if they ran out of formula, then what were they going to do? Because some, you know, the breast milk uh, would dry up, et cetera. So we have a bit of a history where uh, the pendulum, if you really think about it, uh, bottle feeding has been in this country for over 100 years. And so now we're seeing this shift since the 1990s, 1991, when the World Health Organization and UNICEF came up with the Baby Friendly Initiative. And the goal of that was to get breastfeeding back to where uh, the levels were more acceptable, uh, uh, promoting that breast is the best way to feed uh, one's baby. It had uh, all the immunities and nutrition that the baby needed and all kinds of research has been done since. But what we saw, as I said, when we were doing our other research that 83% of mothers initiate breastfeeding, but only at the six month mark are they exclusively breastfeeding. And exclusively breastfeeding means that no other uh, uh, formula or water or anything is introduced to the infant until they're at least six months of age. As a matter of fact, that goal is extending into 12 months. The American Academy of Pediatrics and um, other organizations like CDC and World Health are really an American, I already said that, American Academy of Pediatrics are promoting that women exclusively breastfeed for 12 months, which in, in and of itself, we're gonna have a lot of challenges if we can't even get to the three month or the six month mark. So given this high rate, women who do not breastfeed are thought of as bad mothers in research done by uh, Appleton and Ludlow, and they experience guilt and shame and stigma. So stigma, to define that, is um, it's communicated through verbal and nonverbal messages. Uh, as, as women, we know, I mean, from the time the baby is handed off to us, we are observing and, and nurses are looking to see how is this mother uh, attaching to her baby, the parents interacting. And we also get those looks when we know that uh, if you're sitting out and uh, either breastfeeding or bottle feeding, uh, you may get that look. And we all know when we get to look that they just don't approve of what's going on at, the, at that time. Uh, in this study, what we looked at is we compared social and personal stigma experienced by mothers who chose to use infant formula with mothers who were not able to breastfeed. So kind of think about that. We have women who come in to the hospital and most of them have already made a decision to either breastfeed or bottle feed. And the women who had, um, as I'll show you in, in, in the next few slides, um, those who chose, uh, who were unable to breastfeed had more stigma associated with, with their own personal feelings. The study that we did, it was an in-depth online Qualtrics survey. And Qualtrics is a, uh, uh, a, they have, it's a suite that has a panel of uh, where they can find your, um, your participants. Uh, and these women or mothers, whoever your participants are, get paid uh, a certain amount to answer these surveys. Uh, we were fortunate to receive a communication arts and sciences uh, grant. Uh, it was a small grant, but it allowed us to then have 250 mothers to complete this survey. We analyzed internal stigma, internalized stigma and perception of stigma from others. We looked at what was the maternal warmth toward the infant and hiding formula use. Uh, we also used in our study the uh, mater Mercer's maternal role attainment theory. And this looks at, uh, again, as women uh, attach and bond to their, ch to their child, we're looking at some of the characteristics that help to foster that positive relationship, such as empathy, self-esteem, infant characteristics such as temperament uh, and how they respond to the mother. Uh, maternal identity and competence, so she wants to feel competent in her role as a new mother, uh, and maternal gratification and attachment. And this, of course, then will have uh, a connection to that child cognitive development, behavioral health, and social competence. So we have a nice theory that really has explored that mother bonding, mother-child bonding, parental bonding, uh, partner, uh, and how those things can be influenced 
on those early days that are very crucial um, in having that attachment occur. We also used a theoretical uh, framework called um, Framework Integrating Influences on Stigma Model. And what this does is it looks at three different levels of stigma. Um, the first level is called micro level, which focuses on personal characteristics leading to stigma. So this is how that individual feels about themselves. The meso uh, level focuses on public perceptions. So how are you being perceived, by, or you perceive that you're being perceived by other individuals, whether it's in your environment, uh, in the hospital setting, you know, that, that type of stuff. And macro level is concerned with normative beliefs governing a particular behavior, which is actually looking at, so what's going on in the cultural area? What are the expectations uh, to govern that behavior? And, and when Kathy mentioned earlier that the pendulum is swinging, again, a hundred year history of formula feeding, and now we're finally getting into the breastfeeding uh, component. But bear in mind, 100 years is a long period of time where the standard norm was bottle feeding. And so we're, we're looking at how do we promote and what do we do for women who are still um, may have issues with bottle feeding or breastfeeding. And that's what this topic and research was done uh, about. So related to breastfeeding, micro level focuses on, on, on how women internalize stigma associated with not breastfeeding. So they take it internally. We all know how that feels. You, you don't feel like a good mother if someone's looking at you wrongly or they may make a comment uh, or they just don't attend to your needs. They just dismiss you. Uh, meso level is how other people react to mothers who do not breastfeed. For example, um, you have somebody that may, oh, you're, you're going to do that. And, and interestingly, um, I worked at Sparrow Hospital for 13 years before we went down to Indiana. And I worked in uh, the mother-baby unit. And I, I saw moms who were breastfeeding, who are, not, who are now the women who are bot uh, bottle feeding, get that same behavior. Oh, you're going to do that? You know, so it's kind of, swinging to the other stream, but we still have a lot of, of, uh, of room to grow and change. The macro level focuses on social expectations about breastfeeding. As I said, the baby uh, friendly initiative is very um, powerful and it's, it's emerging. And, and we have, um, I looked up the data right before I got on because I thought I, I want the most current data. And we have 604 breastfeeding um, designated hospitals in this country, which is about 25% of, of any birth area where you're going to uh, go and have a baby. The number is slowly climbing, but it's, it's getting successful. So what did we want to see in this uh, study? We had four research questions. Uh, the first one was, to what extent do women who do not breastfeed experience micro, meso, and macro levels of stigma? Number question two is, are there differences in stigma experienced by women who choose not to breastfeed and those who are not able to breastfeed? Question three is, what is the relationship between connection with the infant, hiding use of formula from others, and perceptions of micro, meso, and macro stigma? And then our last question was, we had an open-ended um, box where we asked the participants to list at least three comments when other people discovered they were not using infant formula, that they were using infant formula, sorry. I think my computer froze. Ah, there we go. So the results of the uh, sample, uh, again, there were 250 women. The characteristics, we had infants that ranged in age from newborn to nine months. Uh, the average age of the mother was about 32 years of age uh, and 60% uh, had two or more children. 32% uh, reported they chose to use uh, formula. So we have these women who come to the hospital, they've already made up their mind. So I, I think in one way, once that decision is made, um, prior to coming to the hospital, there's not a whole lot of discussion. Uh, it's accepted that that's the decision. And in some cases, it's not. 50% reported they were not able to breastfeed. 
44% uh, of our mothers, uh, they said that they had to learn correct formula use on their own. And we'll discuss this um, later on in the presentation. Uh, 17 or 6.8% said that their baby was not able to breastfeed to, due to these reasons. Poor milk production, difficulty latching, maternal medication and diseases, infant allergies, to breast milk, inverted nipples, excessive pain, adoption, a premature baby in the NICU, a returning to work and convenience. And 96% gave birth at a breastfeeding hospital and the majority agreed breast uh, baby friendly hospital designation was a good idea. So they weren't opposed to um, the women on our study were not opposed that they were in a baby friendly hospital and thought it was a good idea. And use of formula uh, in this study was not associated with uh, the education level of, of the mother or her income. Okay, so some of the results that we found in our study was that uh, mothers who chose not to breastfeed reported little personal or micro um, uh, stigma or, or meso. So the public, they didn't feel there was stigma, so they were fine, they were comfortable with their choice. Uh, they uh, had family members that supported them. So they went on and, and continued through with what their, their choice was. However, mothers who were unable to breastfeed experienced more internal, internalized stigma, and they perceived that other people saw them as failures. Uh, these mothers were more likely to hide use of formula from others and had lower warmth towards their infants. So you can well imagine that this is a very, um, uh, when we look at the maternal infant attachment, the relationship, this can have lasting impacts for the next couple of months and, and on down the line, if this woman feels that um, she has to hide what she's doing, she feels guilty, stigma, that kind of stuff. And then knowledge about formula use and availability of support resulted in less stigma and more warmth for the infant. So there were situations where these women, they didn't have to learn how to, to prepare the formula themselves. Um, they were given that information before they were discharged from the hospital. So there was a somewhat of a connection between the individual, perhaps the nurse, I would, I would uh, imagine, giving her information and, she and support from her family. So that's very important in um, their relationship uh, to stigma and to the infant. These are some of the questions that were asked in the three different categories of micro, meso, and macro. So if you look at the dark, uh, the bolded numbers here, this was the impact that these questions have. So the, high, the, the higher the number uh, demonstrated that this is where the stigma was, uh, how they felt with uh, they're, they're feeding. So I feel guilty because I bottle feed. I feel ashamed because I bottle feed. I feel inadequate, embarrassed. I regret bottle feeding. And then in the mezzo uh, questions, it, it, uh, they answered, it makes me angry that other people judge me for bottle feeding. Uh, I often am asked why am I not breastfeeding. Uh, people regularly tell me that breast is best. And I'm sick and tired of people who criticize me for bottle feeding. Very high numbers there. These individuals were feeling a lot of that pressure from others, that external. And other people make me feel like a failure as a mother because I bottle feed. Um, and then the ma macro level, what, what's the expectation of others in the, in the community? Mothers who do not breastfeed are treated badly by other people. People think that not breastfeeding means that a mother has a weak character. And other people think that a woman who does not breastfeed her baby is not motherly. And a woman is thought of as a bad mother if she bottle feeds her baby. Um, and all of these were on a Likert scale of strongly agree to strongly disagree, um, seven point Likert scale. Uh, we also asked other questions and I, I didn't um, put up the data or the tables, but we were looking at, we had questions related to hiding the use of formula feelings of warmth toward her baby, education about formula use, availability of support, and that is what type of support did she receive from her significant other, her partner, her mother, mother-in-law, her friends, uh, limitations. Uh, on this, I'll talk about that in a minute, but those were the other areas that we looked at to see um, how, how did this play out in, in her uh, decision-making. Mothers who were not able to breastfeed 
experienced more self-stigma and perceived that others saw them as failures. And as I said before, they were likely to hide the formula and had lower connection with their infants. Now, as healthcare providers, one of our most important things that we want to do is to set this dyad, this mother-infant couplet out in family in a positive way. We want to foster and, or should be at least, uh, promoting bonding, promoting uh, aspects where we know that this infant's gonna be in the safekeeping of its mother's arms or the care provider that will be caring for it. Of the comments, we had over 702 comments, and 33% of, of the 250 women, they, they didn't care. They showed indifference to infant feeding choices. It didn't matter to them. So that's a nice percentage. However, when you add the next couple up, you're going to have more like uh, closer to 50% where 21.5 supported. Um, you got the support of the use of formula. 25% were critical of the use of formula. 16 and uh, 0.6 opposed it altogether. They just, they, they weren't going to have anything to do with it. And six, only 6.5% mentioned the advantage of mother's milk over formula. So you get these individuals who then try to talk with the mom. And I know Baby Friendly Initiative does promote that. Uh, if, if the woman hasn't made a decision or hopefully she's been educated prenatally, on making a choice between breast and bottle feeding. Uh, and if she comes into the hospital, um, there are 10 steps, I'll talk about that here in a minute, um, that the hospital has to do, the lactation consultants, the nurses, physicians, in assisting this mom to make sure that she's been given all the information that she needs uh, to make a uh, informed decision on, on her choice of feeding. So the conclusions that we found is that mothers reported acceptable levels of support for their infant feeding decisions, which is positive. Uh, and the majority agreed that baby friendly designated hospitals were a good idea. Public responses causing a mother to feel guilty for using inf infant formula, of course, results in negative feelings of self-worth and dysfunctional maternal behaviors. And as I said earlier, that last statement actually was what women, when we were having children in the 70s and 80s, felt when we were breastfeeding. So the pendulum has kind of turned the other direction, and that stigma now is, is going in a different direction toward the uh, women who choose not to breastfeed. Both breastfeeding and formula feeding mothers need public support for their infant feeding choices. Um, and there's a few statements here that support that. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists advocates that while breastfeeding confers advantages, quote, each woman is uniquely qualified to make an informed decision surrounding infant feeding, unquote. And then a dilemma for healthcare providers is that in advocating for exclusive breastfeeding as a best practice, we're inadvertently stigmatizing mothers who do not breastfeed. I think it's important, again, to go back to the Baby Friendly Initiative, because there are, uh, not every woman is getting the education uh, on uh, what the Baby Friendly Initiative is. I often, when I talk about it at, at other, you know, with my classes, my students, uh, and I say baby friendly, and, and it, one of the thoughts that typically I hear is, well, aren't all hospitals baby friendly? And you're like, well, we would hope they are, but baby friendly designation is a very systematic process. It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of commitment. Uh, you have to educate not just mothers and fathers and the families, but hopefully prenatally they're getting education. Um, the lactation consultants are educating all the nurses. You have everybody, the physicians, we've had physicians and, and practice groups that also need education. A woman, when she comes to the hospital, needs to know that there will be no artificial teats. We don't use pacifiers in a baby-friendly hospital. Uh, formula is only given if medically indicated. And of course, if the mother's choice is, is not to uh, breastfeed, uh, they have to, not they have to, but the goal is to get that baby on the mother's uh, breast within the first hour of birth. Uh, and then we have to show and help her maintain lactation. Um, as I said, no, no food or drink other than breast milk. And we're looking again, not just the first 
couple of weeks, but we're getting into the six months and 12 months uh, um, expectation. Encourage breastfeeding on demand, uh, rooming in. If you don't have, uh, most hospitals have converted to a mother baby center rather than having a separate um, postpartum and a newborn nursery, but some of those still exist. Um, the goal is to, to have the mother and the father in the room and uh, be aware of the baby's cues for feeding. And this isn't just for bottle feeding, or it's for both, breast and bottle feeding. Babies have the same cues of when they want to eat. And one thing that a lot of people don't realize, if you wait until that baby cries, that's the last um, cue, and that baby's actually pretty mad because that baby's given a lot of different cues. Um, they, they kind of put their little fist up to their mouths, they're rooting, they're looking for a breast. Um, you know, they, they start uh, um, mouthing, they're you know, kind of looking for the breast, et cetera, or for the, or for the formula, they wanna eat. So if you're waiting until that last cue, you're gonna be uh, way, way too late in getting that. Now you'll have to comfort that baby and settle it down. Now, the reason I talk about baby friendly so much is one of the things that people neglect to include with the baby friendly initiative is the 10 steps that the World Health Organization and UNICEF provided called mother friendly. And the reason I think baby friendly is so successful is because it's really uh, organized and uh, uh, all the education and everything is done by the nurses. You don't need a doctor's order to help encourage breastfeeding or bottle feeding. And the baby-friendly um, designation, although it's a very detailed process, the, it's in the control more of the nurses, although you need your physician, cheerleaders, and others to help support it. But the 10 steps to becoming mother-friendly, I think this is where we get into the problem with why when, when a woman comes out um, after she's given birth and she's on the mother-baby unit, there may be some mis misconceptions or misunderstanding that if you labored back, in, and I've been a labor room nurse for 12 years and a director for, for 13, but when you labor back in, in, the, in, in the labor and delivery unit, and if you, you had a long labor, 25, 26 hours, number one, you're getting pretty exhausted. If you pushed for two hours or three hours, because sometimes if you get an epidural, it's gonna cause uh, you to, uh, your contractions to stop. Uh, you're not gonna feel when, you're, when you have uh, discomfort, when to push. Uh, but then you get to that pushing phase and you might push for, as I said, a couple of hours. And sometimes you may end up having a cesarean because at this point in time, uh, baby to baby is showing evidence of fetal distress. So um, they may try to intervene as, as much as they can without a cesarean. But oftentimes you may find yourself in that situation where now you're going back for an emergency um, cesarean. And two hours after you, um, uh, recover back in labor and delivery, you come out to the mother baby unit, and you're actually, whether you had a cesarean or not, you're exhausted. And not only are you exhausted, but now you have, if, if sometimes, I mean, these are positive things that happen back in, in the uh, C section suite get the baby on the breast, get it to, uh, even if you're not breastfeeding, that skin to skin contact is just so important. Um, but the, the problem is, is we don't have the mother-friendly initiatives in place that bring this lady out. If she had a third degree or a fourth degree uh, laceration, and that's, that's a pretty intense uh, episiotomy or, or a tear in her perineum, I mean, she won't even be able to get comfortable to sit, let alone to hold a baby. And, uh, you know, I, I heard a comment once recently where uh, a cesarean mom was um, out in the room and she had all the medication still on board. She was quite comfortable and stuff. But uh, the question was, is we don't let our uh individuals out in the public drive intoxicated or under the influence of drugs. Why do we want our mothers to hold an infant and try to breastfeed and get everything done? Because we have to understand, not all mothers have partners. They don't have a social support person. And even the ones that do, dad's exhausted too. I mean, this is a very monumental um, transition and, and uh, uh, a period of time where it's, it's just difficult. Um, so what we need to do in order to be more 
baby friendly and mother friendly is we've got to look at get our physician partners um, midwives certified nurse midwives who practice have uh, higher um, better outcomes because you know they they don't do cesareans and they, so they're not going to do a surgical type procedure but our induction rate the world health organization says it should be less than 10 percent we do inductions they're supposed to be uh, only done under medically indicated but what we're finding now is and we had a big push for no inductions before the woman completed 39 weeks gestation uh, because they were doing them, they thought the baby was term, uh, you know, uh, grandma was coming into town to help, so everybody wanted things done in a set time. Well, you just set up this cascade of events, and a lot of those early term babies, even if they were 39 weeks, they turned out to be 36, 37, and they ended up in the NICU. So the induction rate needs to decrease. The good news is our episiotomy rate has decreased, and that's where they do a cut to, in the perineum to help give room for the baby to be delivered, um, but that has dramatically uh, been curtailed. The biggest problem is this, the goal for the World Health Organization and um, is to be uh, a cesarean rate for, for uh, community hospitals. Most ho community hospitals have actually gone into the larger hospitals women will go there to have their babies but they want that rate to be 15 percent or less our c-section rate in this country is 37 percent so that means one in three women are going to have a cesarean and i've seen over the years as i said i've been a long-standing ob nurse that we when when back in the 70s and 80s it was literally when i had my first child um one in ten women would be expected and they thought that was bad to have a cesarean now we're up to one in three almost one in four and, and some countries have even a higher rate but the point is we've gotten to the to accept that cesarean rates so what if she had a cesarean birth it's it's no big deal but it's major surgery and so we've kind of put that as on the back burner and and that's where that conflict comes in one size does not fit all when it comes to respecting and fitting and, and feeding your newborn because every woman has their own personal um, uh, uh, issues that are going on with the birth, the pregnancy, post-delivery, all those things. Uh, and these are some of the other initiatives for the baby-friendly educate staff and non-drug methods of pain. I can tell you that there is at as it is with breastfeeding, the pendulum is getting more for women to breastfeed. We're having more women who uh, are choosing to have a non-medicated birth. And so that is good because then there's not that analgesia or anesthetic effect on the, um, on the fetus or the newborn when it's delivered. Uh, we find that uh, oftentimes if a woman does have an epidural, that medication does get into, uh, it crosses the placenta, the baby doesn't come out, it's not going to latch as good. And now with COVID and we're discharging our moms in a shorter period of time, where is the support and, and why is it that we're so quick to want to judge these women because of the choice that they made and how they're going to feed their baby? So. Number nine tenant of Baby Friendly says that when a mother, and this comes from Baby Friendly, and I actually looked it up again today because I have this as 2016. I thought, did they change it? And actually, they did, and they continue to say the same thing. When a mother has chosen not to breastfeed, when supplementation of breastfeeding is medically indicated, or when supplementation is chosen by the breastfeeding mother, and then, of course, they want you to have appropriate counseling and education, it is crucial that safe and appropriate methods of formula mixing, handling, storage, and feeding are taught to the parents. And what we found in our study is most of these women went home and had to teach themselves. They would read the uh, directions on the can of formula or whatever, um, you know, if they were doing the, the ready-made formula, of course, that's easy, but very, very expensive. So we're, we're discharging women and we, we think by osmosis, I guess, that they're going to understand how to um, formula feed and, and, you know, that's their choice, that's their problem, is kind of the attitude that these women are getting. There's also the U.S. Preventative Task Force described the standard of care for breastfeeding as this. Primary care clinicians support women before and after childbirth by providing interventions to help them make an informed choice about how to feed their infants and to be successful 
in their choice. And they go on to say, not all women choose to or are able to breastfeed. Clinicians should, as with any preventive service, respect the autonomy of women and their families to make decisions that fit their specific situation, values, and preferences. So before I, before I finish, I just wanna say that we live in a culture where women, uh, and it's funny how pregnant women and women who give birth are the most scrutinized and everybody seems, I mean, think back uh, when you are pregnant, uh, you're in a grocery store and you get strangers that make comments about you. Oh, when are you due? Oh, you're gonna have a boy, you're gonna have a girl, they wanna touch your belly. We have the same thing happening with how women make choices on how they value and breastfeed their babies. Uh, I've had my one granddaughter, I just showed you here, uh, both my daughters who have had children, even when my daughter would pump breast milk to store or use on uh, if she was out in public because uh, another research study we did on um, supporting women in breastfeeding uh, out in public is, is also stigmatized because we've got a cultural problem with, with breastfeeding. But when she would pull the, her bottle of milk out, she said that some of the people were just so rude to her and it's like, it's breast milk, you know? It's like, get over yourselves. But anyway, that's, that's the world we live in. Okay, um, I think um, I went that fast, but I'm open for questions. Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Goldborg, for presenting such an insightful uh, presentation. Um, I thought your discussion about the different kinds of um, stigma was very interesting. Um, I see we have some questions in the chat um, and in the Q&A. So um, the first question that came in was, can you, I think you just sort of addressed this, can you speak to women who exclusively pump? That's a good question. Um, we find, or the literature, the research has shown that uh, in order to be successful with milk production, uh, the body, uh, as it works, uh, it needs the direct contact of that baby's mouth on the nipple because it helps to stimulate the pituitary gland to release uh, oxytocin. We like to call that the love hormone. That's the hormone that's used for mom and baby to attach and to look and gaze into each other's eyes. And um, so it's that direct contact. So when you're exclusively pumping, you don't get that uh, direct contact. Now, some women, for whatever reason, uh, and I, I can't answer the question, it doesn't matter, um, they, they have no issues with pumping at all. I mean, they can pump and they get bottles filled with breast milk. And then you have women who, who pump and it's like, uh, half an hour later, they only have a half an ounce and they feel guilty about that also. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm a failure. I'm not producing enough milk for my baby. But whatever amount you get, you, it, it's, it's still valuable. Uh, now, we did a study on women returning to work and pumping milk at, at the office or wherever they were. Um, there's studies, or not studies, there's a law by the Affordable Care Act that says you must provide a place for a woman to pump her breast so that she can maintain her, her milk supply. And we did a uh, hundred and some different organizations and only 25% of them had a, a place, a designated place that had a sink for women to go in and use the breast pump. Uh, and we, we surveyed a thousand individuals, 500 men, 500 women. And what we found is that uh, our, our, our male friends, our, our male counterparts, 25% uh, of them thought just the idea of a woman pumping her breast was disgusting. So we've got a lot of cultural factors. And so here we have women trying to be the best they can as a mom, establishing a relationship with a baby, but then we get all these co-confounding uh, uh, problems within our culture. Don't breastfeed in public. You're shamed for that if you pump your breast. And we've got a lot of issues um, related to the breastfeeding um, uh, problem. And I think that helps to increase issues for women who, who choose to breast to, to bottle feed uh, because they feel like, well, I can't, I have to go back to work. I can't pump. You know, so we've got a lot of issues. But if you're exclusively pumping, your milk supply may be decreased. 
Okay, thank you. Sure. The next question, did any of your research show that knowledge about formula increased uh, combination feeding in women who do not produce enough breast milk? Um, I don't think we particularly looked at that, but uh, basically what happens is women will try to do both. Uh, their breast milk supply may go down, it may diminish because breastfeeding is an on-demand process, which means that baby needs to get to the breast as often as it wants to. You can't overfeed a breastfeeding baby. Uh, they control the amount of flow. They control the amount of production. Uh, if, if you decrease, um, if you in, in, increase or bring in a formula, it's going to decrease your milk supply. So it, it gets that pituitary hormone uh, stimulated, and that baby is going the more it... it um, um, breastfeeds, the more milk you're going to produce. We've even had uh, research that shows that women who adopt can, can breastfeed. Uh, it may take a little bit lo uh, longer to get that process going, uh, but a lot of women, if they can't uh, exclusively breastfeed, we do see the, the, the co-formula and bottle feeding um, experience happening. So um, what is one takeaway from this research that you want uh, nurses in particular to hear, whether they're um, labor and delivery nurses or advanced practice nurses? Well, I think the, the fundamental takeaway from this uh, research is moms have a lot of pressure. We all know that uh, pregnancy in and of itself uh, has a high demand on the woman, especially uh, fathers also, uh, go through processes of attachment and that kind of stuff. But w I don't think our job is to judge people's decision. Our, our job as healthcare providers is to support them, to help them. Obviously, we want the best for everybody, uh, but to support and give them the proper education. And no matter, and I've, even with the uh, Baby Friendly Initiative, for them to say that you must teach how to mix, how to prepare, how to do things with formula feeding. We don't know what these women are going to go home to. And so they need to know uh, the safety issues as it will affect their baby. Uh, so we, we're in the, um, most nurses who have gone through nursing school and healthcare providers, advocates. We need to be the advocates uh, and support women's choices. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, next question, what role do you think pediatricians have in making women think that they cannot breastfeed when they are told infants are not gaining at the recommended rate, something which um, the person asking the question has seen often? It's a shame because, uh, again, all you have to do is get that baby to the breast. If the mom's not producing enough milk, then we need to have an intervention to sit down and talk with her. Find out what's going on. What's going on in her environment? Is she in discomfort? Does she have postpartum depression? You know, there's a lot of women who go unrecognized with postpartum depression. Uh, they suffer in silence. They don't realize they have it because most women, and again, I've done my dissertation on postpartum depression. We, we have to, we come into the, uh, a lot of situations where we hide our feelings. We put the makeup on, we do all kinds of things to make ourselves look, look good, but internally we feel awful. But the fear that women have, especially early on in the first few months of, of the baby's life is, if I tell them I'm feeling this way, they'll take my baby from me. Uh, but what we know is the sooner a woman is allowed just having the care provider sit and let them express their thoughts and feelings, the sooner they get interventions. Most will only need cognitive therapy, but if some need medication, especially if they have a history of depression to begin with, we need to support our moms. Having a baby, having an early family, especially uh, for all those involved, is a monumental transition in one's life. Um, and I, and I, you know, some of the old school pediatricians, especially, and some of the newer ones, you can measure, uh, you know, you can tell a woman, you, you see it, you know, got three ounces or four ounces or 10 ounces of formula. And if you don't see that, you know, it, they, it's easier to say than just go to formula. You know, that's an easy, quick fix. I don't think it's helping the mom because now she's still going to feel like, oh, I can't even produce milk. 
um, lots of lots of different issues where it's the support that's most important. Thank you. Sure. Um, I know you've done research on working moms as it relates to breastfeeding and pumping. Can you talk a little bit about um, some of the other research that you're, you've done in this area? Sure. Um, let me think about that. Oh, I did one study. It was a study with a couple of the individuals on my team where we wanted to find out what do nursing students and medical students, uh, what are their thoughts and feelings about extended breastfeeding? Now, extended breastfeeding is when a woman decides to breastfeed her child beyond the six months, beyond the 12 months, and you're getting into the uh, one and two and three years, sometimes even four years of age. Uh, and when they get beyond a certain age, it's not more for the nutrition as it is for the comfort and reducing stress of that child and the bonding and the attachment. And uh, we found that our, our student, our young students thought it was not a good idea that there was something wrong with the mother and her attachment issues where the literature shows, the research does show that, um, and I can't quote any, any research right now, but uh, these children actually, they find that they're more attached, um, health, healthily attached the longer they breastfeed because they've been, you know, it's that trust versus mistrust, uh, Piaget and Jung and some of these other uh, psychologists, but they, they, they know their needs are gonna be met and so they're more willing to explore and go out and come back and forth. So we can't be that, again, we're, there was a, a Time Magazine uh, front cover of a young child, I think he must have been four, uh, and the mom was, and they showed breastfeeding at, at that age. And primarily, a lot of people find that just distasteful. It's like, let the child grow up. But in other countries and cultures, the child breastfeeds whenever it wants. And again, it's not for the nourishment so much as it is for the psychological reduction of stress. So we got a lot of issues with breastfeeding. So the next um, question is more of a comment. It says, this was a triggering presentation. There are disparities in breastfeeding, particularly in the black community. The goal has always been um, able to educate about the benefits. I agree wholeheartedly in supporting women's choice, a true informed choice. With that being said, the goal of education is health promotion and prevention, not to cause shame. The evidence is clear about the infant's microbiome and the impact of cow's protein to a newborn's gut. This information could cause healthcare providers to continue assuming that disparities are cultural and not assist as they would others. So I'm not sure is the question is... Uh, well, I think that this person's agreeing with um, giving women choice and that, that there may be some cultural reasons or other well, reasons why... Well, actually, the, be the breastfeeding rates in uh, women of color African-American, Hispanics is lower. Uh, actually, another study I've done, it's a recent publication, is um, Chinese-American women and their choices of breastfeeding and that kind of stuff. No, I mean, it's a very um, delicate situation when you're, it's, it's not just about the feeding, it's about what you're promoting in the health. Because Think about it, if, if you're not attaching to that child because you feel bad that you're giving it a bottle versus formula, uh, uh, the breast, and you're you have attachment issues, this child, when it gets to be 20, it's not gonna remember it was breastfed or not. I mean, a year after the child, when it gets two or three, we give these kids all kinds of different foods. We just are in the bad process of judging and shaming. And again, if you have an informed, if, if someone literally, this is what they're supposed to do prenatally, and then when they come to the hospital, although most decisions are made before they get there, is to sit down and talk to them. But we don't have enough care providers to do that. It's very time intensive. Even helping a woman to get the baby to breast. Everybody thinks, well, you know, you have breasts, of course you're gonna breastfeed, it's not a big deal. Well, it's a learned process. The mother has, she's never done it before. You know, and the baby is just, I mean, some of them we call the ones that latch on really quickly at like barracudas because they just grab on and there's no problem. But not all babies are like that. So you've got to work with the moms and we've got to respect in the mother baby units that these individuals, uh, you can't just give a nurse 
a, a, an assignment as, a, as an administrator and as a, as a person who's worked in A1, my association for many years, you've got to go by this, the standards on how you staff your units so that we have nurses. You can't just rely on the lactation consultant to be the only expert. All nurses who are in that mother baby unit should be able to sit down, talk to these moms, the, the parents, the grandparents, and give them the most up-to-date information so that they can make an informed choice and decision. Thanks. If there's a follow-up comment to that that says that there's an article entitled, Why Even Bother They're Not Going to Do It by Dr. Thomas, that provides context regarding implicit bias of healthcare providers. And so the thought is, is that we may go into these situations um, as, as nurses thinking that one way is better and making judgments also. Oh, absolutely. I agree with that 100%. We have an implicit bias. I mean, a lot of, I mean, in the culture and the world that we live in today, uh, we're, we're addressing and, and we need to address more what's going on with politics and, and how people are treated and recognized and stuff like that. No, I, I've seen it over the years. I've seen it uh, not, not with just uh, individuals of color. I've seen it with individuals who come from a low socioeconomic status, uh, who they call the frequent flyers. Uh, we have a very prejudiced and biased group of individuals, uh, not intentionally. I don't think they're maliciously, but they've been, they, they don't get it. They haven't lived in those situations, and so they just don't get, um, the, they haven't walked in the shoes of these individuals. And that's what you really have to do. You've got to really spend some time where you can be more um, empathic and understand where people are coming from. But no, I've seen implicit bias across the board. Uh, in my practice as nurse over many years. Thank you. Um, a couple more questions. Have, um, how could medical providers, uh, nurses, best support moms who are unable to breastfeed as it pertains to encountering mastitis? Oh, well, that's a problem that, again, old school thought was if you got mastitis, you took the baby off the breast and you, you supplemented with formula. Uh, and that was actually more around when I was uh, uh, becoming an early parent. But now the research shows that you can take the antibiotic and breastfeed that baby on that side so it can release that milk that's plugged in the duct that's created the uh, situation of infection. Baby's not going to get the infection, but you can still continue to breastfeed. So again, there's these misconceptions of what you can and cannot do. Uh, and uh, so, and we all expect that every single person that comes into our room as a healthcare provider has the exact same information. And we're not, we're not uh, all from the same uh, cookie cutter. We all come from different backgrounds and different uh, education levels and experiences. So that's why you see this miss. I've had many women get upset and complain um, that lactation consultants, they'll have five different lactation consultants and sometimes each one of them give different advice. We need to learn how to be consistent and to, I guess some people don't wanna have a cookbook recipe on how to do things, but sometimes that's not a bad idea because then you get consistency and everybody's singing the same song. So we've got some problems to work out. Um, I think we have um, one more question here. Um, what is what are your thoughts on how doulas should be involved? Well, doulas are uh, a wonderful group of individuals that should be. Uh, if we could have every woman have a doula, uh, you would be amazed at what can be done. Uh, doulas were really first um, uh, used in uh, in Guatemala. Uh, uh, I forget the doctors' names now. But anyway, there were two uh, pediatricians that started to promote doulas in this country. It didn't have a, a good uh, off start, start off. It didn't have a good one. But now um, the problem is, is we need to have it where uh, women get paid or whoever the doula is, is getting paid for the service. Because if you've got the money, then you're lucky. Okay, you get to have the doula. But if you don't have the money, women who are... Um, 
on the fence of a lot of decision making. They need a voice, they need an advocate. If every mom who came into labor and delivery had an advocate like myself, because I love what I do, um, they become that voice and they support and, and they know what questions to ask. And doulas, um, I think a lot of individuals, uh, nurses included, because I've worked in labor and delivery, they just felt that they were more in the way, they were making the decisions for the mom. But in fact, that doula mom relationship is very personal. Uh, they've talked a lot about what the expectations are and how to help through the birth and what to do post-birth. So you have this doula who comes into the home after she gives birth. I mean, it's a perfect relationship set up, but we just, we just don't do that enough. We need, to, we need to have it universal. And that's my personal opinion, but I think a lot of doulas would, would agree. <laughs> and I'm not a doula, so what can I say? So we have... Um... Another question that came up in the Q&A box. Um, I've heard this more frequently in recent years. What is the rate of milk allergy among breastfeeding women and that leads to the discontinuation of breastfeeding? As in, you mentioned that the, sometimes the baby is allergic to the breast milk. I, I, I wish I could answer that question. That's not something I've ever really investigated. Uh, I think there is a possibility for allergens as, you know, substances do pass through the mother's breast milk, uh, medications and drugs and, uh, you know, what you eat, your proteins, all those different things. So um, I would, I mean, if you're concerned, you want to continue breastfeeding, uh, you're going to have to look at what your diet includes. And then, and it's a, a probably a really uh, time consuming process. Uh, but I, I can't really answer it except that you probably have to look at what you're eating and how does that affect the baby, but it would be really kind of difficult to narrow it down. So it would have to come up through when that baby starts taking in different foods. Uh, are they allergic uh, to certain things, that kind of stuff. So um, can't give you an answer that on that one. Good question though. Do you, um, do we teach, um, RNs, BSNs, and NPs about how to teach how to use formula correctly? I can't answer for everybody. I would have to say, in unfortunately, in the course that I teach, it's a seven-week course, and what they're finding in the OB setting and pediatrics for nursing, uh, they've cut it down to a seven-week course because of the once the student graduates, if she or he wants to go into those areas, they have these long um, year, yearly, uh, what are they called? Um, learning uh, internships type things. And so they figure that when you get involved in, you choose that area to work in, you're going to get all that detailed because it's very detailed oriented. I mean, you could spend one lecture just talking about just breastfeeding and another on formula feeding. So we, there, it's in, in the undergraduate program, I probably would say you don't get into that much detail, no, unfortunately. Okay. Um, I think you answered um, one other question that I have here. Um, do baby-friendly hospitals teach parents how to identify failure to thrive? That's a good question. Uh, they should. Uh, I don't, I think, again, it's a time constraint issue with the amount of time the mom is there. You're taking, uh, you know, you're doing vital signs and caring for the newborn. They might have issues with glucose and other things or respiratory rate. And then you got the mom and she might have some issues. They're only there for 24 hours. Uh, this, I doubt that they're getting into that type of detail unless, of course, there's some type of a history or a reason that they might focus on a particular person. So Thank again, you. time constraints. Does anyone have any other questions that you'd like Dr. Goldborg to answer? Now would be the time to put them in the Q&A or the chat. We've answered them out of both places. We'll give people a couple minutes to type.
Not seeing any. Um, I think, um, th Dr. Goldbort, thank you again for your presentation um, and for spending time with, uh, and for all of you who spent time with us this evening. Um, and if you didn't get a chance, oh, there's one more question. If you didn't get a chance to answer your question, um, you can email Dr. Goldbort at uh, G-O-L-D-B-O-R-J at M-S-U dot E-D-U. And um, Marco will send that information out to everybody who registered. Um, let's see here. Looks like there's one more question. Did any of your research show that knowledge about formula in, oh, we did that one. Never mind. The other ones are just thank yous to you. Oh, thank you. It was my pleasure. It's great to be back in Michigan. Although I'm from Pennsylvania, my husband's from New York, Michigan's our home. We had our four children here and my daughter's back up and she has three. So, uh, and I love anything. You have another topic. I can talk about birthing, whatever you need to know. I, I just love this area. So all I can say is go green. <laughs> There's one more question that just popped up. Um, how do I, as a new labor and delivery RN, start feeding uh, with the new dads? Start feeding with the new dads? Yeah. How do you get them involved in the feeding? In the oh, feeding? Yeah, get them up close and personal with mom. Have them support her arm. Have them get her pillows. Um, the comfort. Get her some water. Give her, you know, every time a woman sits down to breastfeed, the last thing she thinks of is herself. You know, she's like, oh, I got this baby crying. You know, change the diaper, get them involved with that. But bring her some water, some juice, some food, rub her back. Uh, dads can get highly involved. And then when mom is done breastfeeding, he can open his shirt and put the baby skin to skin and let that baby get used to him. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of wonderful things things going on those first few hours of birth and and before they leave the hospital so uh dad doesn't have to stand back and say i can't do this oh, yes you can get them involved don't give them an out uh -uh, not gonna happen thank you um to all of you thank you again please stay tuned for more information about upcoming conversation webinars in the near future um, we hope to have one every other month so there will be one in November. Um, you can always keep in touch with the College of Nursing on social media. Um, just search for it. And um, I will say to everybody, take care, stay well, and please go out and vote. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, everybody.